Scarcity is the human default. We were built for an environment where we can never eat enough and nothing of value lasts. And if we were to venture too far away from the tribe, we would die. Yet, in the modern day, our inbuilt mindsets of fear are exactly the opposite of what we actually need to thrive and be happy. This entire area is such a fascinating topic that I love diving into. And it's something that I think you can just always keep coming back to because it's just so fundamental to the human experience. Certainly in the modern day, we have growing anxiety and burnout, and a lot of the answers are completely within our own capabilities to fix, but we can't see them. So hello, and welcome to the Growth Mindset Podcast. Today, I have Kyle Livingston on the show, who is a serial entrepreneur, and he's someone that really has just lived through so many things coming from starting in a place of scarcity and anxiety and how he's overcome that is just a brilliant story that I think will really help other people develop better mindsets, which is why I'm really excited to share this epic interview. And to kick off, Kyle has a truly insane story of growing up and, and I'm British, so I'm quite understated at best. So I wouldn't say something like that lightly. So honestly, Kyle blew me away with how he overcame to fairly crushing start to life and yeah take notes enjoy the stories and the lessons from Carl Livingston hello and welcome to the growth mindset podcast today we have Carl Livingston on the show who is an entrepreneur and business owner he runs the seven figure industry.com and in his own words is a chief bottle washer and trash taker outer and <laughs> he has a really fascinating story from his life which I can't wait to get into so Kyle welcome to the show Oh man, thanks for having me. I'm excited to chew through some of this today with you. We had a first attempt, which we both mutually agreed, like doing it at a different time. It was just coming up for the holidays. And we're like, why are we on this call? And we're like, I don't know, let's hang out and just have some fun. And felt like we were going to get along. So I'm looking forward to this interview. So you alluded to a very interesting upbringing. And one of the ways I'd like to start the show is asking people where they think their mindsets came from and what they were like as a child and how they grew up. So if you want to, Take it away with that side of things. That would be really fascinating. Yeah, man, absolutely. I joke with one of my buddies. His name's Anthony. I joke with one of my buddies and he's always telling me, he's like, dude, you had every reason, every opportunity, like everything stacked up against you to go left at every point in your life and like take the road that everybody else takes. And you didn't. And that really comes from part of the way I was brought up without getting too crazy into the details of the story. I was actually left at a yard sale in one of the most ghetto places in Southern California when I was 12 weeks old. The family that was having the yard sale had intended on adopting me previously. The adoption didn't go through. And my birth mom was kind of a druggie. And from what I understand, she had had three attempted abortions with me. One of them at a clinic, two at home, nothing worked. I ended up being born six weeks early, a little premature. And I was in an incubator for six weeks. And then I got out of the hospital for six weeks and she just had no business being a mom. She basically comes to the yard sale that these people are having. And she's like, hey, can you watch him? I know you wanted to adopt him at some point. Can you just watch him for a couple hours? Like, I need to go party. I haven't had my fix in some weeks. I need to go party. She just didn't show back up. Called up the next day or the day after that and said, hey, listen, like, if you want to keep him, you can. And so that's how my life started. And growing up in that house and in the area, dude, it just wasn't a good spot. Like, it wasn't a healthy environment in the community that we were in, in the house that I lived in, obviously my parents did a really good job at raising me and I'm thankful for them. But like I had siblings in the house who were druggies, didn't live in a very good neighborhood. And from the moment I was literally born, dude, like I had every reason to play victim and play the, well, this was the hand I was given to me type of mentality. And I was able to turn it around into taking control of my own life and everything that I have going on now is just, it's because I understand that I am in control. So were you just always interested in different things from when you were like a five-year-old to everyone around you? Or did you just have like a revelation moment when you were like 18 that you're like, shit, I could actually do something else with my life? So how did that come about? I think it was a culmination over the years. I can't remember one moment where I'm like, this is going to be my life. But I do remember growing up and seeing the mistakes that my older brothers made and my sister. And I remember having to in essence, bounty hunt some of my siblings around the country because they skipped bail. And like, I saw all the drugs that they were involved in and the commotion and the arrests and all those things. And so at a young age, I kind of learned from their mistakes. If I go this path, I get these things. And so I kind of started going on that path and 
quickly realized that like, man, if I go down this path, I'm going to end up just like the rest of my family is right now. And so it was really a culmination of learning from other people's mistakes and seeing like what they have, I don't want. So I think that's what ingrained that mentality into me. It was just learning from their mistakes. Do you feel like the fact that you were not a blood part of the family, that you felt slightly distanced from the rest of them? As in like your brothers and sisters, or I don't quite know your family dynamics. I would say no, but to be fair, I don't know any other way, right? Like I don't know what would the other side would feel like. And I would say if anything, like it, as a child, I would use that as ammo when I argued with my mom. Like that was the one thing that I can remember growing up. It was like, I'll just go back to my real mom. And like, as a child, I would use that as, as like me throwing rocks or ammunition. But no, I can't say I felt any different, man, to be honest with you. I f always felt like part of the family, never felt like I wasn't. I consider them my parents and my brothers and like they're my family. So yeah, I don't really, don't feel like blood had anything to do with it, to be honest. Glad I asked though. <laughs> it's, it's hard to know until you, you ask these things. For sure. It's a valid mm. question, man. It's a valid question. I've talked to some people who are adopted. They're like, yeah, I can't resonate with my family. We're not blood. I'm like, that's weird. At what point did you start being sort of quote unquote successful? And how did that come about? Was it like you went to university? You just sort of started taking small jobs and just compounding? I'm actually going to go back to a piece of my childhood that I felt was a turning point from like a financial perspective. So there was this one summer where my parents were big into the church and I wanted to go to Bible camp that summer. The church that we were going through, they charged you for the camp. You had to pay for the camp, et cetera, food. And I remember going to my parents like, yeah, we can't afford to send you there this year. Maybe if you save up some money, you can go next year. My dad knew some guy down the street and he got me to mow his lawn for five bucks or something. And I remember mowing the lawn and going like, well, I'm just going to go ask his neighbor if he wants me to mow their lawn too. And so I just started knocking on doors in my neighborhood, asking them if they wanted me to mow lawns and wash cars and all this stuff and saved up enough money to go to this camp. And when I came back, I just kept doing it. Like it's how I'm going to make money, right? If I want the shoes, if I want the whatever, like I got to go do this. And I kept knocking doors in the neighborhood. And there was one really good week that I had had where I had knocked doors Monday through Thursday, and then had a bunch of deals that I went and washed cars and mowed lawns on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And I remember sitting on my bed and counting all my money I got from like Friday and Saturday, it's Sunday or whatever, I'm counting my money. And my mom walks in and she's like, are you counting all the money you've been saving up for the last few months? And I'm like, no, this is what I made today. And she sits down on the bed next to me and she has this look on her face, looking back, like she probably thought I was like selling drugs or something, right? But like, she looks at me and she goes, you made more money than dad did today. For me, my dad worked 100 hours a week in two jobs. He drove an hour and a half each way to work. Like he was the hardest working man that I've ever met in my life, even to this day. And for my mom to tell me that, I immediately knew something was off and something was really broken. At 14 years old, if I can make as much money as my adult dad who had been working in the same trade for 30 years, I quickly realized that I could make a fair amount of money just hustling and just doing little things here for people. And so that kind of shifted my mindset towards what's possible. I think I began getting into self-development around 16, 17 years old. I did wrestling and I had a buddy of mine. We were out on a wrestling tournament and we're staying at his dad's house. His dad comes out and we're talking and he goes, look, man, I really think you would really like this book. And he hands me how to win friends and influence people. I'm 16 years old, never read a book in my life. So I read this book. And it completely changes the paradigm of how I perceive success. I'm like, well, if they can do it by thinking and talking, I can do it by thinking and talking. And my goal forever up to that point was, dude, if I could just make $10,000 a month, like I'm going to win. And so 15, 16, 17, 18 years old, my goal is 10K a month, 10K a month. If I get to 10K a month, bro, I am set. I can go get the Lamborghini. This is my childish brain. I can go get whatever I want. That was my first goal that I had had coming out of that season of my life. If I could just get to 10K a month, but it all started washing cars and mowing lawns, man. With the 10K and wanting a Lamborghini, what then changed around that? And did you get a Lamborghini once you hit 10K? Like, <laughs> I got a toy Lamborghini maybe when I hit 10K, but definitely not a real one. Here's how it's changed for me. And with the moment I realized 10K just wasn't going to be it, I was actually driving down the freeway. I was 18 years old and I was driving a work truck that I had from a company I was working for. It was a 15 year old F-150 with a piece of plywood for a tailgate and half of the steering wheel was ripped off and it had like metal steering wheel and like a cushion steering wheel. 
and it was just an old beat up work truck. I'm driving down the freeway and I see this big giant billboard and it says, if you didn't make $10,000 last month, call me with a phone number. That's all it said. I bust out my cell phone. I call the number and I get a voicemail. So I'm this excited 18 year old kid. Hey, what's up? I just saw your billboard. I want to make 10K. Call me. Candidly, I forgot I even called on this stupid billboard. Three, four days go by and this gentleman named Randall calls me. And I'll never forget him. We still stay in contact to this day. And he brings me into this real estate investment education network marketing type thing back then. And I'm sitting in this room and I'm watching and listening to these guys talk about 50, 100, 2, 3, 400K month revenue, like income. And I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. You mean 10K is not the end? When I get to 10K, I'm not going to have everything. And so that opened my mind. I still hadn't reached 10K, but that opened my mind to 10K is just the tip of the iceberg. And so fast forward to about two years later, I'm still working construction full-time and I'm working my face off in construction, working hard because that was what I knew. And I crossed the 10K month mark. And I realized that all I did throughout this season of getting to 10K was just raise my living expenses enough to feel like I'm still poor. So I have 10K. But I also have living expenses that makes me feel like I make 3K. And so there go my wish and dreams for a Lamborghini at 10K a month, right? Now I'm down to a Hot Wheels Lamborghini. I still don't have the Lamborghini. Probably will never have the Lamborghini just because I think it's a waste of money now. But once I got there, I just realized like that wasn't what I was actually after. And the pursuit of the dollar was different than the pursuit of the freedom. I wanted the freedom, but I thought I wanted the money. So how come you then went on to make a lot more money if you're like, actually, I don't necessarily need the money to make me happy. It's more the freedom to do what I want. Well, I look at money as fuel, right? I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. I'm a believer. And so a lot of what I do in my life is surrounded around the kingdom of God. And so how can I use this money to then move forward other Mm -hmm. ventures in life? Because money at the end of the day is simply a resource. It's like, Sam, what kind of car do you want if you could have any car in the world? I'm thinking like I might get a Skoda. Okay. Now, if you don't have gas to put in the Skoda, it's not going to go anywhere. You could have the most badass car, but if you have no fuel for it, it's not going to go anywhere. And so I think we're all equipped with a certain set of skills that if we utilize our skills, there's a payoff. And so for me, business and work and entrepreneurialism and like profitability, like that's my skills that I've developed over the years. But the things that I use the money for is completely separate than actually having the money. Getting the money can create the freedom through real estate or through investments or blah, blah, blah. But then also getting the money, for me, fighting sex trafficking is a big thing on my heart. And I'm never going to be the guy that walks up and like kicks the door in like Kool-Aid man rescuing these women and children. I'm just not going to be that guy. But I do know that that takes money and resource for those guys to do. And so if I use my talents to create resource and use that resource to impact other areas of the world. To me, that's what it's about. It's not about just stacking hundreds of thousands of dollars in a bank account somewhere and being like, I'm rich. This is awesome. That's just not what it's about. I definitely agree. As in, I don't care so much about money necessarily just for myself and what I want to spend it on directly on my own like means. But in terms of what I could use money for to do stuff with, there's like, yeah, I, I'm happy to make more money and be useful. And I've kind of intentionally not trying to earn too much money this year compared to like, as I've had to say no to a lot of things where I could have been making lots of money to just go and do my own thing a lot more on like content and doing fun stuff. I just kind of reached 32 and was like, yeah, realize I really like doing sport and definitely too late to be an Olympian, but going to try and break some world records on other things that I could still do and just sort of have a year doing me fun things before it's too late. And that's important, man. Here's one of my biggest mistakes on that note is I spent so many years of my life chasing the money that I ruined relationships with friends. I ruined a marriage. I ruined my health at some degree. Like I ruined a lot of things chasing the dollar. It's like if my dog gets out and starts running down the street and I start chasing her, she's going to start running faster. And money is the same way. And it's like I, I chased and chased. I'm like, shit, I just sacrificed everything and I still don't have the money that I want. Did you have a burnout moment, like when your marriage got ruined and stuff and you're like, shit, why am I doing this? Where did you come to work that out? First marriage got ruined, didn't pay much attention, just kept going, just thought we grew apart. We got together really young, blamed it on other things. I had built and sold three brick and mortar construction companies up to this point. 
Some of them were really successful. Some were still successful, but not as. And I'm on my fourth brick and mortar business and we're in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I have about 20-ish employees working for me at the time. Some of them lived with us in the house. Some of them lived in an apartment we had rented. And I remember we went to the store to get some dinner or groceries or something. And I pull back up into our house in Albuquerque. And I remember as I'm getting in the house, like I'm just not feeling real well, feeling kind of nauseous, not feeling good. As I'm going to walk into my bedroom, about 10, 15 feet before I get into the bedroom, I just collapse. Boom. I can't feel my arms. I can't feel my legs. I feel like I have an elephant sitting on my chest. I'm 26 years old thinking I'm having a heart attack. Like, shit, this is how I'm going to go out right now. 26 having a heart attack like this sucks they rushed me in an ambulance to the hospital and i remember three moments over the next 32 hours the moment of falling to the ground the moment of being rushed into the ambulance i remember our neighbor coming and checking on me so i remember seeing his face his name was andy and then i remember waking up in the hospital with all these wires all over me while they're doing a bunch of tests the doctors come back in after running tests for 20 plus hours on me and basically tell me like hey there's nothing wrong with you you're healthy. It must have just been a panic attack. I'm like, a panic what? I have no idea what this is. No idea what an anxiety attack. No idea what a panic attack is. Nothing. So I go home and the next day I get back to working. And my now wife, who my girlfriend at the time, she's like, hey, like, you need to chill out. You need to relax and take some time off. And for the first time in my life, I had figured out and found out what anxiety and panic felt like at 26 years old. And it was because I had ran so hard, so fast for so long chasing a dollar that I, again, I neglected to take care of my health and it neglected to take care of my mental state. Like for you, you're like, dude, I just want to take a year off and do me. Like I had never done that. I had been from 16 to 26 working my face into the ground for a dollar. I didn't notice it at that time, but over the course of the next few years, as those patterns continued to happen, I had to take a step back and say, like, why am I still feeling the same way I've always felt? And I realized that that moment when I collapsed onto the floor was my body's way of saying, like, hey, man, you can't go down this path anymore and you have to do something different. Do you feel like you had anxiety over money that made you kind of want to keep on getting more of it then? I suppose so. Yeah. Nothing ever felt like enough. No matter how big a deals we did, no matter how many payouts we had from clients, I just took that money and just went and hired more people or bought more trucks or did more things to further the business. Like it never felt like enough. And the anxiety around not having enough, I think was the anxiety pain point, not the anxiety around going and finding it. It was the anxiety around not having enough because growing up, there would be times where I'd be coming home from school and I'd go to get in the shower and I'd turn the shower on and nothing comes out. My mom's like, oh yeah, our water got shut off today. Well, when can we get it back on? Probably next payday, two weeks from now. Shit, I have no water. And so now we're taking a bath out of borrowed water we put on the stove, you know? And it's like, we heated up the water on the stove and we took a little bird bath with lukewarm dish water, basically. So I was always trying to run away from that. So the anxiety that did arise was from just not having enough. Kind of scarcity mindset versus abundance mindset, would you say? thousand percent did you have any like therapy to get over these things or was it just like intentionally being like okay i need to take some time off and actually nothing's going to fall apart because there is probably enough money for me to be alive like how did you get through that shift it wasn't through therapy necessarily it was through other coaches and people there was a time where i needed to invest to get some help that i needed from a coach and there are a lot of scammy coaches out there like not every coach is going to help you out so I got it through coaches challenging me on my beliefs. I got it through reading books and challenging me on beliefs. I got it through attending seminars. I got my help through like the self-help kind of world, not necessarily getting down and talking through it with a therapist. And who knows, dude, maybe there's some stuff that they can pull out in me that I just don't see. But yeah, I'm not a huge fan of like sit and chat therapy. Kind of the point of therapy is to challenge people on their beliefs, like you said was the thing that helped you, but in like a supportive way to make them kind of not feel like they're dumb, but to be like, oh yeah, I could just see the world like this and just sort of just run through like the different, like, we just have so many hypocritical things that we're thinking about as in like, obviously just trying to make as much money as possible so you can enjoy your life, but yeah, you can't enjoy your life if you're just constantly working, et cetera. And that was the thing. Like I got to my first 10K month and I was like, dude, I have no time. Like I just worked a million hours this month. Like I can't actually enjoy my money. Definitely are. So many people that don't travel or something until they have enough money i'm like you don't need money to travel <laughs> at all you can literally even if you can't play an instrument you can literally busk across spain and like 
people have done this <laughs> where you can't even play instruments and made enough money to live and you can have a like, time of your life being quite silly traveling but yeah mines with funny things dude they're such funny things and i always tell people the six inches between our ears are the most deadly thing to ourselves that exists if you want happiness or you want joy or you want to go bust around spain like our minds are conditioned to tell us no almost it's that fight or flight response like you know, when you think about the way we're primally designed, it's like we're primarily designed to hang out in the community so we don't get eaten by bears. And when we want to go outside of the community, everybody's like, be careful, you're going to get eaten by bears or lions or whatever. So our brains are kind of wired that way to be a little fearful, a little timid, a little scared. And it's up to us to rewire some of that and figure out it's not actually as scary as everybody tells me. That's what they perceive it to be, not what it actually is. 100%. I think traveling is one of the most useful things for people to go into to realize how not scary so much stuff is. And because something always goes wrong and you're like, shit, this can't go wrong. And then it goes wrong and then everything's fine. And you're like, oh, things can go wrong in my life and it's okay. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You always make it home. One of the things that I've done when making decisions, like let, let's use the busking around Spain for an example. I can't play an instrument to save my life, dude. Like if you asked me to play a guitar or you would have to shoot me, like, dude, Get it ready, because I'm not going to be able to play this guitar very well. But like, let's just use that as an example. And so if I were to go and say, okay, I'm going to go travel around Spain. I have no money, and I'm going to learn to busk around Spain. What I would do and how I operate in a lot of decisions in my life is I'll take a yellow legal pad, and I'll write down what I want. Right? Tour around Spain. Busk around Spain. And I'll write down all of the worst case scenarios that can possibly happen. And I know this sounds counterintuitive to a lot of things. But like, I'm going to write down everything that could possibly happen. And I'm gonna get to the end of this list. Now, I'm gonna be relatively conservative with real life. Like if I didn't have somewhere to stay, I could probably find somewhere to stay for five bucks and go make five bucks. Like I'll probably never live under a bridge. That's probably never going to happen. I could go live in a hostel, logo, whatever. And so I'm gonna go down and write down the worst case scenario that could possibly happen to me. And I'm gonna get to the end of it and I'm gonna review everything. And I'm gonna say, okay, well, if these things were to happen, would it be worth it still? And most of the time, the answer is yes, it would still be worth it. It would still be worth it if I had to go busk around Spain, wear the same pair of underwear for two weeks and live in a hostel to be able to see the countryside and enjoy the good food. It'd still be worth it. And what I'll do is I will sign the bottom of the paper. And anytime that fear begins to creep back in, I go to that contract I made with myself and I'm like, hey, I expected this to happen. I said it was okay. I'm just going to keep going. That's super good because it's so easy to think of the bad things, but then when you don't have awareness around it, you just only think they're bad. But if you can just write it down and look at them and go like, hey, actually, this is okay. I can deal with that. It's suddenly much more empowering. And the thing I always try to be mindful of is that it's just, it's five times easier to think about the bad things that will happen than it is like the good things. But so much stuff that you can't imagine can happen. Like you'll meet some guy that's sort of got a really nice car and wants to take you somewhere cool. And then you just end up partying somewhere and you'll meet your future wife. Like random stuff happens and it's amazing. But you don't really imagine those things. You just imagine like the problems, especially if you're someone that is a bit good at like making things up as you go along, things are much more likely to end up working out really fun as well, which is something you'd learn by traveling. I read a cool thing about luck. There's been like there's four types of luck and then just, just like the random chance luck. But then there's also being able to spot when luck is coming towards you through like experience and stuff, which if you travel and do things, you just sort of see those things coming. Or if you start a business and you kind of see the opportunities of like, you know, knocking on people's doors and being like, actually, I can just make more of this luck where it already is. You learn these things. So putting yourself into those scenarios is just so useful for becoming luckier as well. Thousand percent, man. I agree with that. And I love the, you can see luck coming. Because the more and more I play this game of entrepreneurship, the more and more I see like, that person didn't get lucky. They just saw it coming and knew what to do because they've been there before. Yeah, when I heard it written like that, I was like, yeah, exactly. I just sort of know what's going to work and lucky, whereas other people just seem to be like blind to stuff that's just going past them. And you're like, why are you not taking these opportunities? What's wrong with you? But you just know where these things are. So where are you at now? What are you actually doing in terms of your businesses and stuff? So it wasn't without failure. I lost everything in 2016. In that fourth company where I told you I had collapsed, I lost everything. I ended up running it into the ground, lost a ton of money. Lost everything in 2016. Got into another business partnership shortly after that. Lost everything again. End of 2017, early 2018. And so in a matter of three years, I lost everything in my life twice from a financial and resource perspective. 
what that did was it really showed me what failing feels like and what losing a business feels like. And like you said, you can see luck coming. I can also see failure coming now because I've watched it come at me head on twice. And so right now what I do is I work with online businesses and I really help them streamline their business to be able to get the owner out of the day to day. So you have a lot of owners who are just running around like chickens with their head cut off inside of their business and trying to do a million things and put out a million fires and they just don't understand how to run a business. Maybe they're an expert, maybe they're a coach or a consultant or they run an agency. They're really good at what they do, but they don't understand the principles of running a business. And so we come in and we help them actually create and form a business so the owner can actually run a business and not just be an expert in the space with employees with the goal eventually of being able to sell the business for a multiple. But in the meantime, between where they're at today and selling, we really turn that business into just a cash generating cow for them so they can go use that resource to do other things in their life too. That's cool. Yeah, I certainly agree with what you said around like also being able to see failure coming because having been through a few failures, like talk yeah. to so many entrepreneurs now, I'm like, yeah, I think it's great. Good luck. Uh, by the way, do you want to maybe try this? Hey, okay, whatever. You'll work it out. But yeah, it sounds like a really good use of your skills and like interests and like interest in helping people as well. So that's really cool to hear. It's been real fun. One of the things you might get a kick out of is when I first started doing this, I'd work with kind of anybody and everybody. But now that I've been in it for a few years doing it this way, I have one rule that I will not negotiate on. I will not work with a business owner unless they have failed in the past. We call it cycled. So unless a business owner has grown something and lost it, I just won't work with them because they can see failure coming too now. And so because of that, when you work with someone who can't see it and you're telling them like, hey man, you're in the middle of the railroad tracks. There's a train of failure coming your way. You need to move. And they don't listen to you. It's painful watching them get hit by that train of failure. And it's almost as painful for me going through it as it is watching them. That's really interesting. What about, because I do like mentoring people like when they're younger and things. And so how do you approach something like that? Or do you just not take someone on if they're just like really young, but like they do need your help? I used to work with kind of everybody. I'll refer them out to people I know that can serve them better than I can. The thing that I'm looking for is in, at this point in my career, in my life are really big levers. Everybody's coming up with their word for the year. Like my word for this year is leverage. Like how can I create a really big lever or go to a really big lever and pull on it versus a really small little lever. And so I'll refer them out to people that I know and trust that are set up to work with people like that. But yeah, I don't work with them directly. I, I'll refer them out to somebody that I know can help them better than I can. Something else that I feel I've also learned through along with like the spotting luck that's coming along or like when the failure is going to happen is that if you have a set of skills, you may as well go to the people where they're most valuable and you can just do so much more with your skills when you have people that like really need them as opposed to trying to help people that haven't got any like actual skills themselves to do anything useful with what you're trying to help them with or money or assets and things. And yeah, if you're super good at like helping people grow a YouTube channel and you go to someone with like a million subscribers, you could create another million subscribers in like a month. Whereas if you double someone with 10 subscribers, it's not that much kind of thing. And so, yeah, you can just be so much more effective by going to bigger levers. So do you have like a framework around like business size or anything at this point now, or like what the kind of things are that you would specifically help with? Or is it just kind of Anyone running a business that kind of just needs someone to make it more formal. It's got to be an online business. They have to be generating at least 150K a month in revenue. So between 1.5 and 1.7 million a year is kind of the target. Online coaches, consultants, agencies, some type of a service-based business, not really a product-based business. Has to have failed in business. They have to understand marketing. And typically, if somebody understands marketing, they understand sales, and there's not that great a business, we can come in and find tons of money laying on the floor in their business. And the things that we really focus on are like the infrastructure of their business. Because a lot of the times, man, as shocking as this is, you have businesses that do hundreds of thousands of dollars a month and their entire business is ran on like a Google spreadsheet. You ever seen that like statue of the Atlas Stone? The, like the person's carrying that big world? That's how most business owners feel is they have the world on their shoulders. And so we go and create the infrastructure so it holds the world and the business owner can get out from the day-to-day -day of the business. And so that's the first thing we do is build that infrastructure to hold the weight of things. And then I'm a big believer that you should make decisions off of data, not emotion or conjecture. Once you begin making decisions off of emotion in business, you typically are going the wrong direction. 
You have to make decisions based on data. So the second thing that we do with these clients is we gather all the data, we make it all accurate and reliable. And then I'll teach the business owner how to actually diagnose problems inside of their business. And so if they're spending too much money on marketing and not generating enough profit, I'll teach the business owner how to actually go in and troubleshoot that problem. So I'll teach them kind of how to fish rather than just fish for them. So I studied biology at university and then proceeded to run a bunch of businesses. And people were like, how are you running businesses? You studied biology. I'm like, one, people who never studied anything can run a business. Two, science. Make a hypothesis of what will work and test it and work out why it's not working without getting lost in your own ego and being an idiot and just deciding it's going to work anyway. That's literally how to do a business. And like evolution and competition and all that stuff is literally how businesses survive and change and thrive, but just with animals and stuff. So a science around like your business and just like actually working out why things are happening and questioning it instead of just assuming stuff is pretty essential. Cool. And how did you like first go from a guy that had run a few businesses, some successful, a few failing to helping people with their businesses? Was there just someone that you knew that you're like, oh, actually I can sort that out for you and just suddenly realized that you were just becoming a bit of an agency? Or did you formally go, right, I run this seven figure agency and starting from nothing. So when my fourth brick and mortar company had to close the doors and we lost everything in 2016, I committed to getting out of the brick and mortar world and committing to go to the online world. And so that was the transition of my life was like, I have to get out of brick and mortar and I have to get online. And I began looking and researching and asking people who were doing well online, what they were doing, how they were doing it. And to be honest, I paid lots of money to get into really big rooms where people in masterminds were doing what I wanted to do. And so I had to go find money half the time, go leverage money, borrow money, make money, something to get into these rooms. And then once I got into these rooms, I could see what was kind of going on. I could get some help. I could ask for things. Initially, I went and bought an RV, gutted it, remodeled it, traveled the country in the RV for a little while, which was awesome. Totally a story for another time. I bought every course and program that I could possibly find on online marketing. And I sat in the forest for the next six months and I watched everything over and over again. And I said, I can do this for other people, for small businesses. And so I started having conversations with business owners saying, hey, let me do your marketing for you. And at the time, that was a really big thing. And so that's what kind of got me into the online world. And the shift that happened for me was I was running ads for this gentleman out of New York. And he owned a brick and mortar construction business that was a very specialized niche construction business. And we were running ads for him. And he calls me, he goes, hey, man, we have to turn ads off this month. He's paying me on retainer to run his ads. I was like, why? They're crushing. You're getting leads. You're getting work. He's like, I can't fulfill on all the work we're doing. I have too much work, too much opportunity. I have to stop paying you the retainer. We got to shut off ads. I remember hanging up the phone. And I'm like, dude, this is my biggest client. Like, what am I going to do here? So I call him back. I'm like, hey, you're not going to stop paying me retainer. I'm going to send you the invoice for next month but I'm going to fly up to New York and I'm going to fix your operational issues in your business. Because I had had a construction business. I knew the struggles he was struggling with. I knew I could fix them. Thankfully, it agreed to keep paying me retainer. I flew up to New York, spent four days with him in person. And then over the course of the next few months, you know, we'd, I'd fly up there occasionally and spend time over Zoom. Over the next year, he doubled his business. And I was like, whoa, that worked really well. And then... Just one thing led to another. And I just started doing that for more and more people and realized like people don't need help with marketing. There's plenty of people that can help with marketing. There's plenty of people that can help with sales, but nobody knows how to actually run a successful business. And so I just started approaching people who had big levers I could pull and saying, hey, if I come into your business and do X, Y, and Z, what would that be worth to you? And they would give me some crazy, ridiculous price. And I would come in at you know 25% of that and they were stoked. That's kind of how it all started, just become more refined and better from there. And there's been clients that we've completely just didn't do what we thought we could do and had to refund their money. There have been other clients that we three, four X what we thought we could do. And so there's been a healthy mix in between. It's not like everything's always perfect. Like these, everybody kind of leads on online, but it's just gotten better and better over the years. So one thing I find a struggle with is that I do like variety. And so in terms of running my own business, I do also get a bit like, oh, shit. <laughs> Whereas I have kind of thought around doing that-ish with people and like, I like kind of jumping into other people's problems and like sorting lots of stuff out and then like leaving and not having to run all the day to day. So it's kind of interesting just the way you sort of describe it. It's like, yeah, that's, that's, that's the kind of things that I often 
kind of like getting involved in and doing. It's a blast, man. I mean, I encounter different challenges every day. And I'm like, I'm a construction guy. I like to fix things. I like to solve things. I like to build things. And so we go into different businesses and different problems and among calls of people that are, these people are trying to solve this problem. These people are trying to solve a completely different problem. But in any business, there's only so many problems that need to be solved. You're only going to have a handful of problems within marketing. There's only certain things in marketing that aren't going to work. There's only going to be a handful of problems in sales and acquisitions. There's only going to be a handful of problems in the rest of the business. Like once you've seen so many and done it so many times, you realize that there's patterns. and There's only like seven or 10 things in each category that can really be wrong. And so it might feel like you're solving a completely different problem, but it's at the core, probably a issue you've solved a dozen times before. I don't know about like hard topic change, but like, how do you feel about like relationships and things and people being like, oh, we have such a special, unique relationship and we're very different versus like actually most people, their problems are kind of similar. Dude, I think relationships, and it's just something that to be candid, I'm still working on in relationships. Like I don't have relationships knocked down perfect at all. I'll give you this example. I was having a conversation with a group of guys today. One guy, his wife just walked out on him beginning of the month. Another guy, he just went through a divorce like six months ago. And they're talking about all of these things about like becoming better and you know, if you wouldn't date yourself and all these things. And I think relationships really get boiled down at its most simplistic level of if you treat yourself and you take care of yourself and you become the best version of who you can become, your relationship will be something special and unique because 99% of people aren't willing to do that. Think about how many people you know that go through a relationship and they're fat and then sick. They get a divorce and nine months later, they have a six pack and they eat nothing but chicken and broccoli. Or you see these people struggling with money and struggling with finances in a marriage. They get a divorce and all of a sudden they're wealthy and rich. It's the same people. It's just their willingness to invest into themselves because by nature, humans like to point fingers and blame, especially men, like we have this ego. It's like, I can't tell you how many men blame their issues on their wife. Like, oh, it's my wife's fault. Dude, it's like, you're 48 pounds overweight haven't been to the gym in two years and hardly got out into the sun in the last two weeks. You look like an albino cupcake and you're talking about your wife, you know, X, Y, Z. Dude, go to the fucking gym, go for a walk, go outside, be better. And I think that those special relationships, quote unquote, are special because people do special things like take care of themselves, which most people don't. I like that. That's great. <laughs> and yeah, hundred percent. And there's no reason that you can't do these things. It's total responsibility. Nice. Glad I asked. <laughs> Sometimes I have a bit of a topic change. Like, I'm not sure why I asked that, but I've just I've gone there anyway. I was like, yeah, had a feeling. Cool. Interesting. So do you find your friends often come to you to advice or do you think you just give people advice? Because just my nature, I kind of have to be careful of just giving unsolicited advice. Thousand percent. And so we'll get into conversations with people and I'll ask them like, hey, do you want my perspective here? And I think I've done a really good job at surrounding myself with people who play at a high enough level. Like they take care of themselves. They operate in a way where they think in abundance, whether it's financially or emotionally or spiritually or whatever. And they're in a place where they're wanting the constructive criticism. They're wanting the feedback because at the end of the day, their pursuit is the next level of who they should be. Well, I think friends that can be honest with you are super valuable. Because then to people that will just sort of come and say great stuff, but the ones that will tell you when you're being an idiot, are super useful. <laughs> this just happened in November of last year. I have a buddy of mine and I was telling him about this problem I was having with the client. And I was telling him about this thing I was trying to solve. And I don't know, we might have to bleep this out, but he goes, he goes, can I just be honest with you, man? I was like, yeah. He goes, I think you're just being a little bitch. And I just needed to hear that, you know, it's like the, the little slap across the face. And it's like, I just needed to hear that. Granted, he wasn't very gentle about it, but like, I'm not a very gentle human, so I could take it. And like, it was what I needed to hear. And most people will not be honest with you enough to tell you when you need a wake up call or when you're being soft or when you're being too nice or when you're being too mean or whatever. I just don't think people are willing to do that. Another one is when you had your failures. Did you have friends that were specifically really useful and others that you're like, shit, I thought we were friends and now you're completely unhelpful? Yeah, thousand percent. Through my failures, besides my now wife, I've had one friend that stayed with me the whole time. Everybody else will just stop talking or leave or it's like they were your friend because you were successful, not because they were your friend. 
So yeah, hundred percent. I definitely had 99% of people leave. Do you feel like the same would happen again now? Or have you been intentional at making relationships that have a bit more substance in them? Or do you think it's just like impossible to actually make that happen? No, I, I think it's about who you surround yourself with. And now I'm at a place in my life where the friends that I have, like if I were to fail tomorrow, one, they would figure out how they could help me get back up and win. But they would also champion me and stick around. Like, I, I can name 10 people to you right now that I know if I were to fail tomorrow, would be right by my side in six months. Sick. Yeah, happy to hear that. And it was just, again, being very intentional with who, who I'm setting friendships up with, what their goals are in life. Like, I found it very hard for me because I have such big, ambitious goals to surround myself with people who don't. Like, if your goal is fat Cheeto fingers, making $27,000 a year, living in your mom's basement, we just can't be good friends because we, we live in totally different worlds. Yeah, struggled with that. A few things to like finish up on. What is one of the kindest things someone has ever done for you? Well, my immediate reaction, one of the most kind things that I had ever done was I, I had gotten sick with the flu and I'd had some friends come over and they delivered like a care basket to my house and they hung signs on the street that was like when I needed to leave, it was get well soon signs. And that was probably one of the most kind things. That was, as soon as you asked me, that was the first thing that popped in my head. And that was 10, 12 years ago. Like, I still remember that to this day. Like, they hung signs on the stop sign, underneath the stop sign, and on the telephone poles all the way down the street, which is signs saying get well. And that was just really sweet. Yeah, it's just nice to sort of see the things that like actually stick in people's minds and remember. Because it's just, if you ever happen to be in a similar situation, it's like, oh, shit, this is an opportunity for me to like make someone stay. So, um, noted. Thanks. And then what is one of your earliest ever memories that's vivid? And can you please describe it? I remember we had the gravel road that we had, like kind of gravel, kind of not. And there were these black tar squares that we had on this road that we deemed state squares. And so we'd mark them out in chalk and we would draw on them and they'd be the places that we'd go practice our skating tricks because it was the smooth spot you could skate on out of the whole street. That was the one smooth spot. I'll never forget, we had this menace on our street named John. And so we written all these things in chalk. I'm like, I don't know. How old I was six, seven years old. We'd written all these things in chalk. And this guy comes up with a bucket of water because it's in front of his house. And he just demolishes everything that we had painted and like drawn on and everything. And like he took the skate squares away from us. I had a bunch of friends that were all like upset and angry because this guy washed away our skating squares. <laughs> cool. It's a totally random question that I just asked someone once and was like yeah i have no idea <laughs> what's going to come out of people's brains uh, when i ask and it's just nice so um thanks all right and then okay finally any sage advice you'd give to yourself 10 years ago take time to think about what you're doing and not just work through the problem but take time and critically think about how you can solve this without just working and working and working and working and working okay cool and then what do you think your 10 years ago self would have said to that or would have needed further to make them like actually do the time as in like, would there have been like a specific example of being like, okay, if this happens, actually sit for half an hour and just like call someone else or talk. Like, is there something you could do that you can explain that would make it more practical? Because it's really good advice, but often good advice is really hard to do. You know what I mean? The, the moment a problem arises, my default is to start working on it. And so I have had to catch the pattern of before I put my hands on it or my, my attention to it, take a step back, especially when I'm feeling really overwhelmed, and maybe even read for 10 minutes to shift off the subject and then begin thinking about how you would solve it. So like for me, it's like when a new problem arises and I want to put my hands to it, just taking a moment to actually go and solve it and think about how I would solve it first. Cool. Thanks so much. That was really, really fascinating. I'm super glad we got to hang out for an hour and talk. It was great, man. Hopefully your audience got some stuff. And I just want to say thank you for taking the time out of your days to, to go through this and to do this and to pour into your audience. People don't understand the effort that goes into these. And so just wanted to say thank you for doing this, man. Very, very much appreciated. Thanks so much for Carl coming on the show. What a total legend. So many take-homes. I'm a really big fan of his message of just taking time. Because our first reactions are often not as useful as our more thought through actions and being slightly strategic can save us so much time and headaches and make our life a lot better. And then similarly, his idea around taking the time to write out your fears and your worries before you do a project that you're scared of doing or that you might never do because you're scared of it 
is such a powerful way to just realize that all these things that you're worried about, when you look to the end of them, they're not that bad. And you can actually go and do this thing with a lot less fear and do it better because you're not scared about what's going to go wrong and just enjoy it for the moment. That's just a really powerful one for life. So I'm really glad that he shared that because honestly, when you get to the bottom of most things, as long as it's not illegal, it's really not going to ruin your life. And we can often discover so many cool opportunities that we never even imagine unless we face our fears. So on that, embrace your fears and bloody go and enjoy your day, your week and your life. If you feel like hitting us up with a positive rating, that will certainly help other people discover us and put a spring in my step. Thanks for listening.